Rebecca's handing these out. Uh, I just want to thank her uh, for so um, generously inviting me to participate in this um, event. Uh, quite obviously, quite an unusual um, community. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that, that you're each unusual, uh, though that may be true too. I just mean uh, that there is something, something that goes on year after year like this uh, has something uh, important to people. So that's always, that's always cool. Um, I guess we're at the last panel, the few, the proud, the exhausted. Um, I was not uh, out late, so um, I'm not uh, too exhausted. Um, Rebecca's handing out my one and only um, uh, visual aid, and uh, I guess I'll just get started uh, explaining what that is. Um, sometime in the 1890s, the American polymath Charles Sanders Peirce sat down at his writing table, wrote the words, art chirography, at the top of a sheet of paper, and began to transcribe the words of the raven. The opening words of Poe's famous poem here find themselves visualized as if they were in a state of agitation. The tails of the peas slide down the page as if dripping or dissolving, while the upstrokes of the L's and D's rise like smoke. End line downstrokes are regularly swept back across a page as if an invisible wind propelled them. The poem itself seems to emerge from a vorticial O, and some extensions curve and arch toward each other as if drawn by a force of attraction. The ink throws a connecting bridge across the void of the sejura before nothing more. I have two questions about this image, or images, since the experiment in art chirography, which we could plausibly translate as fancy handwriting, uh, absorbed Peirce enough that he repeated on five separate sheets of paper. The first question is, what the heck is Peirce doing here? Uh, and what, my second question, if anything, does it have to do with Poe? The title for my talk is Making a Sensation, and I will get to what interests me about that phrase shortly, but let's follow my initial questions first. What is Peirce doing? He is transcribing a poem. We need first to remind ourselves what kind of a thing a poem was to literate folk in the 19th century. People read a lot of poems, and they read them to each other, and they copied them down from memory, or as an aid to memory, or as a token for a friend. People did all kinds of things with poems in the 19th century, other than read or interpret them. Non-reading can also be a productive enterprise, writes Michael Cohen, one that takes many forms, from ignoring, forgetting, and suppressing, to copying, transcribing, reciting, memorizing, collecting, exchanging, and mimicking. All of these ways to not read a poem are important counterpoints to their more obvious alternative. Poe's Raven was an enormous success upon its first appearance in 1845. It made a sensation, to recall my title. And it was much parodied, or mimicked, to use Cohen's word. Indeed, its susceptibility to parody is one reason the poem has had such longevity. This susceptibility to parody is a matter both of the poem's meaning, which can be riffed on, mocked, inverted, and of its form, specifically its metrical patterns and rhyme scheme. Uh, this form tends not to be parodied so much as borrowed or copied. Nevermore might become Eat My Shorts in Bart Simpson's version of The Raven, but we still have the OR sonority that Poe placed at the navel of his poem. Many people doubtless had The Raven by heart in the 19th century, or parts of it, and it's very likely that Peirce did. About 40 years before he sat down to pen this art chirography, the, Ch the Cambridge Chronicle, his school paper, reported that the Raven was, quote, recited by Charles S. Peirce in a most superior manner. For effective reading and speaking, probably this young man stands at the head of the school. Childhood friend Mary Huntington also remembers Peirce reciting the Raven. Quote, you were famous at this time, and when you were much younger, for your powers of elocution, and often a charmed circle of family and friends would listen to your declamation of Edgar Poe's Raven and other blood-curdling poems. Declamation, recitation, acting, all these were consistent pleasures for Peirce. And the attention he gives to matters of elocution, prosody, and literary analysis, all found in the archive, bespeaks an abiding absorption. Just a uh, parenthesis, the archive of unpublished materials of Peirce is about 100,000 pages. So it's a, it's a big archive. 
Uh, true child of the 19th century, Peirce understood recitation as a form of elocution and poetry as a kind of music. Fastening upon a poem titled Kila, first published in 1902 and said to be a lost poem of Poe's, Peirce subjects the poem to a prosodic analysis, speculating that it may be a dry run for the raven and asserting that in some ways Kila is superior to it. In one of the few published comments on art chirography, I've really only found one. Thomas Winner suggests that the sheets, quote, represent Peirce's attempt at representing the phonic semantic knot, that mysterious junction between sound and meaning that forever seemed to elude him by pictorial representation. I don't think that's what's going on here. The script of anomalies do not seem driven by phonic considerations. Rather, the shape of the letters themselves are gripped by some distorting force that pervades the entirety of the poem. There is further evidence that these sheets are unique. The archives contain other specimens of transcription, of the opening of Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard, for example, or Longfellow's The Arsenal at Springfield, both fairly common set pieces for high-end schooling, such as Peirce received. Peirce was the son of the um, mathematician uh, uh, at Harvard, Benjamin Peirce. So he had a very, very blue blood um, upbringing. Peirce's handwriting with the Gray and the Longfellow is pleasingly ornate, but it is nothing like what he does with Poe. Uh, it's perfectly possible that the Poe and Gray and Longfellow may all have subjected themselves to Peirce via an embodied memory of recitation. But if that is a necessary explanation for the, Poe's availability, for the poem's availability for Peirce's art chirography, it is not a sufficient one, given the vi visual distinctiveness of his treatment of the rating. And so, let us shift to a different mode of embodiment. Let us turn from the ear to the hand. The meaning of handwriting in the 19th century was extremely complex, and it was intricately entwined with mass publication, something Poe thought quite a lot about and with some sophistication. His submissions uh, in 1831, his very first publications uh, uh, to, and to a mass press, to the Baltimore Saturday Visitors, th these were the texts that gave him his start, were written to look as much like print as he could, uh, as if willing his manuscript into print. Some years later, Poe's popular autography series both mobilized the popular conviction that one's handwriting held unique traces of the writer's personality and lampooned that conviction. And here I need to look at my title more directly. We know that in the 18th century, especially the relationship between physiology and representation became an object of sustained interest. A man of feeling was both a body and a soul, and importantly, a social soul. Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments was probably the most coherent and sustained effort to map the role of sensation in the working of what can be called the social body, the movements of sympathy, identification, and disidentification that serve as the glue for social relations. An individual body has a feeling. It registers a sensation. But so too, in a different way, does the body politic. The phrase, making a sensation, arises first in relation to certain kinds of political pronouncements, which were understood to affect or agitate nations or populations. By Poe's time, however, the phrase referred more often to media events. Eugene Aram is making a great sensation. Everybody has either read it or is going to read it. So goes a notice of Bulwer -Lytton's, about Bulwer-Lytton's 1831 novel. It is this sense of the phrase that Poe invoked when he said he wished to make a sensation with his balloon hoax. Why does this pertain here? Because making a sensation as a media phenomenon is one way in which affect supersedes individuals. It begins to envision a world in which feelings are not in us as much as we in them. A world traversed by media. Some of these media are technical media, the telegraph, say, photography, indeed the mass press. And some of these media are people. Spiritualism, to give a single name to a wide and complex range of phenomena, and the development and use of technical media are, from this vantage, two sides of the same coin. And this reminds us that another thing you could do with Poe's poems in the 19th century was to make up new ones and attribute them to Poe. <laughs> I have mentioned the publication of the pseudo-Poe poem Kila in 1902. Some years before that, the Hoosier poet James Whitcomb Riley perpetrated a hoax by pretending to have discovered a lost poem of Poe's titled Leonani. His idea was to first make a sensation with this media hoax, then reveal himself as author, thereby garnering the attention for his own poetic skills he felt were being denied, not having a name like Poe's. It worked like a charm, by the way. Many people admired Leonine, including the great British evolutionary scientist Alfred Russell Wallace, who, in fact, strongly resisted the idea, even when Riley had confessed, 
that Riley had composed Leonini, deeming the poem, as Peirce had done with Kila, so poesque that it must be genuine. A committed spiritualist, Wallace also admired greatly the poems by Poe that were dictated from beyond the grave to Lizzie Doughton, who recorded these spiritual communications in Poems of My Inner Life. One of the things you might do with a Poe poem, it turns out, is receive it from the other world and or float such novel productions in the published world to make a sensation. The essential is this. For Doughton and Wallace, and even perhaps another way for Riley, Poe's poetry is capable of granting access to cosmic dimensions, invisible worlds. Science, spirit, poetry, and mediality become knotted together. In the 1850s, a man named Joseph Rhodes advocated the practice of psychometry. Quote, to perform psychometry on a person, clairvoyance only needed an autograph letter from him or her. Buchanan's theory was that the relative strength of the writer's phrenological lobes left a signature on the page, a residual imprint of the character preserved in nerve aura, Buchanan's new name for animal magnetism. Clairvoyance registered this, registered this fluidic signature either by touching letters still sealed with their hands, in which case the impression gradually passes up the arm and reaches the brain, or by placing letters in the center of their foreheads so that the sillage of soul could pass directly into the mental organs. Thus psychometry. Peirce was interested in examining possible manifestations of the real, and ghosts were among them, writes his biographer Joseph Brennan. But he arrived at some of these interests through different pathways than others. In the 1860s, Benjamin Peirce, Charles's father and the leading mathematician of his era, was hired by the prosecution in the Howland Will case. The case involved a series of signatures. The question was, were they genuine? Benjamin hired his son Charles. Charles examined photographic enlargements of 42 genuine signatures for coincidences of position in their 30 downstrokes. In 25,830 different comparison down, comparisons of downstrokes, he found 5,325 coincidences so that the relative frequency was less than a fifth. Applying the theory of probabilities, his father calculated that a coincidence of genuine signatures as complete as that between the signatures of the codicil or between either of them and that of the will in question would occur only once in 5 to the 30th power times in other words, the unusual uniformity in downstrokes indicated forgery. Rather than the personal signature being a unique link to an individual by way of a settled habit, the purses assume the handwritten signature to be a zone of errancy, of chance. The Howland Will case was the first in which probabilistic reasoning was admitted as evidence in a U.S. court of law. And perhaps through this experience, Purse saw the writing hand as a site where chance might exercise its sway. Beginning in the 1880s with a lecture at Hopkins, Design and Chance, continuing a few years later with the unpublished A Guess at the Riddle, and then elaborating in a series of essays published in The Monist in 1892, Peirce elaborated a speculative evolutionist cosmology. A first move in this argument was to refute the necessitarians. A world in which probabilistic phenomena are real is clearly one in which there is a place for chance. Quote, this is Peirce, the proposition in question is that the state of things existing at any time, together with certain immutable laws, completely determine the state of things at every other time. Thus, given the state of the universe in the original nebula and given the laws of mechanics, a sufficiently powerful mind could deduce from these data the precise, the precise form of every curly Q of every letter I am now writing. This Laplacian determination of his every curly Q, Peirce resists. Quote, the laws of physics know nothing of tendencies and probabilities, he agreed. But life, starting with protoplasm, does. In general, Peirce concluded, the universe evolves from mind to matter, from feeling to habit, from chance to law. Quote, it is essential that there be an element of chance in some sense as to how the cell should, shall discharge itself and then that this chance or uncertainty shall not be entirely obliterated by the principle of habit, but only somewhat affected. The writing desk was obviously a place of some drama for Peirce, and exactly along the lines we are pursuing. In Man's Glassy Essence, terrific essay, by the way. If you have to read only one of them, that's probably the one to read. Uh, Peirce writes, quote, A man may sit quietly at his table writing, doing practically no physical work at all, and yet in a few hours be terribly fagged. This seems to be owing to the deranged sub-molecules of the nerve slime, not having had time to settle back into their proper combinations. I think you all probably have had experience like this, and you've <laughs> wondered about your deranged sub-molecules. Um, nerve slime, 
was Peirce's term for protoplasm. <laughs> Peirce's take on protoplasm was notable for its openness to variation, even at the level of the individual. Peirce looked to protoplasm as the source of signification, writes Robert Brain. With a deep commitment to a universe of absolute chance, Peirce used mathematician Arthur Cayley's mathematical theory of tree diagrams to reject the assumption that there is but one kind of protoplasm, insisting rather on the possibility of, quote, minuter pervasive variations which characterize different breeds and single individuals. What I wish to draw attention to here is the way the workings of mind and feeling, which for Peirce is the work of thought, is an always invisible tussle with derangements of submolecules in the protoplasm and the opposed tendency to the taking of habits, quote, the settling back into proper <laughs> combinations. The tendency of this labor, so exhausting at a writing desk, is toward habit, law, generalization, and the removal of stimulus. It is, quote, it, quote, it is precisely action according to final causes which distinguishes mental from mechanical action. And the general formula of all our desires may be taken as this, to remove a stimulus. Every man is busily working to bring to an end that state of things which now excites him to work. Something not unlike Freud's notion of the death drive. Peirce's rather melancholy vision here suggests that all our mental labor is excited by susceptibility to stimulus, to what lies outside habit and understanding, by susceptibility to chance, in other words, and labors to bring such excitement to an end by controlling it, corralling it rather into law, habit, and generalization. The perfectly lawful world, on the other hand, as Peirce understands it, is entirely dead. The cosmos evolves. The cosmos evolves, not just life. The cosmos evolves from absolute inchoate feeling or mind to presumably absolutely ordered and lawful matter, from life to death. Each of us, unique as our curlicues, wrestles with the feeling, the chance that impinges on us. This happens within and without us at all times. In Persis Cosmos, feeling is not in us, we are rather in it. Indeed, we are concretions of feeling. Quote, again from uh, Man's Glassy Essence, all that is necessary to the existence of a person, writes Peirce, is that the feelings out of which he is constructed should be in close enough connection to influence one another. Very peculiar. Now, how does this bear on the sheets dedicated to art chirography? What does Peirce experience as he sits at his writing table this time? What I want to argue is that Peirce actually effects a kind of transmediation of Poe's poem, takes the allegory about chance, mind, and habit that the raven provides. Remember, in the raven, the narrator is sitting in a room nearly napping. He's sort of in a kind of semi-somnolent state. Uh, the bird uh, incurs, there's a kind of an intrusion of a kind of chance and truly uh, weird uh, nature. And then the poem unfolds as an attempt to um, 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 control the uh, refrain, as it were, in ever new combinations. Right? So, it's a, so the, the poem is, in a sense, a, a, an account of the taking of habit, or what first we call the taking of habit. Um, uh, so he uh, takes an allegory about chance, mind, and habit that the raven provides and offering himself, Peirce, as a kind of recording device, inscribes that allegory as a visual image of chance and habit in constant combat. The random event, the advent of a speaking bird, initiates a series of queries that make the bird's reply never bore a habitual, habituated refrain. The narrator of the poem builds the poem, as it were, as a kind of house or container for the bird's cry. The poem is the, material, the materialization, the reduction to a state of things, of the chance element of the bird's advent. It enfolds, perhaps even encrypts, the random as a refrain. As Peirce and Freud would agree, this movement to rationalize a painful excitation is perfectly commensurate with what Poe calls the narrator's, quote, human thirst for self-torture. The removal of excitation is death, but the poem itself outlives the narrator, and the bird still is sitting, still is sitting. The poem, as artworks tend to do, has impersonalized the affect not to Gilles Deleuze, uh, has created a monument that confides to the ear of the future the sensation, the persistent sensation that embody the event. That's paragraph. Peirce takes this entire, this entire cosmic drama and receives it as if he were receiving the various invisible vi vibrations that so preoccupy the science of the day and on which technical media built their ever-expanding empire. And as Robert Brain reminds us, protoplasm itself was the ultimate storage medium, the pervasive record of random deviations and the habits 
they spawn. Purse's letters are intended, the letters on the sheet, they are acts of intention. Uh, but they are also images of chance and regularity offsetting, offsetting one another, as, quote, deranged sub-molecules might do in the nerve slime that retains them. Purse remediates the raven into protoplasm. He has made a sensation. Thank <laughs> you.